Corey, thanks for that extra uh, little section of the prelude. Um, Psalm 145 is our call to worship. Welcome to Brushy Fourth Baptist Church. Uh, we look forward to worshiping the Lord and hearing from His Word, singing praises to Him, and uh, hearing uh, and uh, experiencing His Spirit work in our life this morning. Uh, so the Lord has, has done great things uh, for us and in us, uh, hasn't He? Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds. And I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for this passage of Scripture. Lord, it is an encouragement to us. Lord, you have done great things. And Lord, we are thankful that your steadfast love endures forever. Uh, Lord, as we uh, talked about in Sunday school, uh, your judgment is severe. And Lord, your judgment is righteous and just. But Lord, we thank you that there is a way of escape, Lord, that uh, through a personal relationship with your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we can have uh, the hope of eternal life. So, Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, uh, we, uh, our voices lift up with the, the same type of uh, praise and worship as the psalmist. Lord, you have truly done remarkable things. Your, your awesomeness in every part of that word is manifest. Lord, you have rescued your people from, from Egypt. Lord, you have, you have rescued us from uh, the, the plight of sin and the, the cost of sin in our lives. Lord, you have, uh, you have provided a way of redemption. And Lord, all we can do is, is stand in, in honor and, and praise for you. Lord, uh, may uh, the songs we sing, may the prayers we pray, Lord, may they be a sweet smell in your nose and, Lord, a, a gracious sound in your ears. Lord, uh, I pray that uh, our worship would be a, a blessing to you. And, Lord, that uh, your spirit would bless us through the process. And, Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you would turn to uh, the book of Haggai, the book of Haggai, uh, we have uh, two more Sundays, if I can read a calendar right, which some days that is questionable. 
Um, but uh, two more Sundays before we start into good, uh, uh, Palm Sunday and Easter. Uh, so uh, thinking about that and looking at that, uh, I uh, chose uh, Haggai as our uh, look into uh, for the next two weeks. Um, so uh, we, we looked at Habakkuk, which if you know where Habakkuk is, after the last couple weeks, your Bible may fall open to Habakkuk. If you go right, I believe it's two books, uh, you will find Haggai. So Haggai is an Old Testament prophet. He is in the book of 12, uh, a short book. Two chapters. We're going to cover uh, chapter one this morning and chapter two, Lord willing, uh, next week. Have you ever uh, received a job or some instructions that you are wondering, what in the world is your boss or your parents or uh, somebody that has charge of you? What were they thinking? What uh, what possessed them? to give you this type of instruction. I can remember uh, soon after I got my license at 16, I can't remember exactly, but it was sometime that fall still, uh, my birthday's in September, uh, so it was sometime before the weather uh, turned cold. Uh, I woke up uh, one day and my dad said, Chris, you're gonna go and you're going to get some hay, or not some hay, but some straw. Uh, there was some type of, my dad was always uh, sowing grass. I don't know where he found so many places to sow grass. And I can't remember if this was uh, a, a section of the soccer field that we were re redoing, or if this was at his apartments where he had had to do some work and he was having to replant some grass. But he needed some straw to uh, cover the section of grass that he had planted to keep the birds from stealing all the seed. Um, so, as a newly minted driver, he gave me charge of his truck and his 16-foot-long trailer that I was to drive uh, on the interstate uh, from my house to St. Albans, which is not a terribly long drive, but... Uh, when it's the very first time that you struck out with something attached to your back, it was a little nerve-wracking. I was, I was perfectly content to stay on the couch all day that day. I did not need uh, the white-knuckle stress of, oh, dear Lord, if I wreck this thing, my dad is going to kill me. Don't worry about the truck. Worry about me. This is not going to go well. Uh, uh, so... Uh, I think it may have been the only time in my life where uh, I intentionally and purposely drove 55 on the interstate all the way there and all the way back. Uh, but uh, uh, Dad must have known something about me that I didn't even know about myself because uh, either with his good training or the Lord's good hand, uh, I made it there, uh, back that thing up to the place I needed to, which was an act of God as a 16-year-old. And uh, got the, the straw and got it delivered to where it needed to go and accomplished without any, uh, any physical harm to myself or any of the, the equipment involved. Uh, so it was, a, it was an accomplishment. But sometimes uh, we encounter instruction and we encounter uh, things that catch us off guard and they surprise us. And we think, what in the world? Why me. Haggai deals with that, and, and in a way that uh, we, as we're looking on the outside, we may rush to judgment towards the Israelites. Haggai is, is dealing with those exiles that have returned from Babylon. This is after uh, the book of Habakkuk, and uh, they have returned from Babylon, and they have set out to build the temple, but there were some opposition. There were some problems. Uh, all the nations around Israel did not want Jerusalem to become strong again. They, got, they had uh, benefited from the fact that there was one less mouth to feed around there and they didn't want Jerusalem to rise up and become a, a reason for Persia to take notice and divert any more funds. So there was a, a self-preservation in the nations around uh, Jerusalem. 
Uh, they didn't want Persia to divert any more wealth or power to anybody else. They wanted to, to grab hold of and keep what uh, they already had. Um, and there was some political opposition, and there was some, uh, there was, because of the political opposition, because of the, the um, political maneuvering with the, the uh, king of Persia, then uh, the project of rebuilding the temple had kind of fallen by the wayside. Uh, they had uh, built the foundation, they had got the, the altar ready for sacrifice, and they had built that. And that is as far as they had gotten. Um, so the title of this short series, these two messages, is Don't Miss It. Don't Miss It. And the main idea this morning in Haggai chapter 1 is don't be captivated with something good when God has something better or his best in store. Don't be captivated with something good and miss God's best. So let's look at Haggai chapter 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your field. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declare, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins. While each of you busies himself with his own house, therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and on the hills and on the grain and the new wine and the oil and all what the, on what the Lord or what the ground brings forth on man and beast and on all their labors. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheptiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Let's pray. Father, as we look at this book of Haggai, I pray, Lord, that it would uh, call us to a uh, understanding, Lord, that, that there are times that we can pursue good things, Lord, at the expense of your best. So I pray, Lord, that our eyes would be opened and, Lord, that we would seek to be obedient. Lord, the call here to the people of God is, is simply to be obedient. Lord, God gave uh, Nehemiah, God gave Ezra a, a God-given instruction. But yet your people had become dissuaded and slow to obedience. Lord, uh, I recognize that uh, our hearts may have wandered in the same way. Lord, we, and we may be caught up in, in good tasks, in good things. But, Lord, those good things could rob us of the best that you have for us. So, Lord, I pray that we would be, uh, we would open our eyes to, 
to the truth that is here in Haggai, and Lord, that you would open our eyes to the circumstances around us, and Lord, that we would pursue uh, your best in obedience to you. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. We have to understand some, thing about, some things about Haggai. You probably don't know a whole lot about Haggai. Well, there isn't a whole lot to be known about Haggai, other than uh, we know he's a prophet, and uh, he is a major prophet in the minors. Not really. His, uh, his prophetic utterances uh, accompany um, just a mere uh, short amount of months. Uh, he's on the scene, and he's just there uh, for a short period of time. Uh, we understand what is going on because we have some context from the book of Ezra. Ezra mentions these two people that uh, Haggai mentions, Zerubbabel and Joshua. Uh, Zerubbabel is the political leader and Joshua is the spiritual leader of Israel as they have come back out of Babylon and they are uh, building uh, back the city of Jerusalem and reconstituting the, the nation of Israel. So, uh, Haggai is a prophet amongst the Jews that have returned to Jerusalem from exile in Babylon. Uh, we, we get some information from Ezra chapter 5 and Ezra chapter 6 about Haggai. He's mentioned in conjunction with Zephaniah, or I'm sorry, Zechariah, wrong minor prophet. Uh, Haggai and Zechariah, uh, they prophesied at similar times. And uh, in fact, uh, they join together right here. Haggai, uh, Zechariah follows right after Haggai in our biblical order. So we also need to realize that Haggai's ministry lasted a mere four months. He was a long-lived prophet. In fact, he lived before that. He lived after that. He didn't die in that time. But his prophecy, his prophetic ministry only lasted about four months uh, in Jerusalem to the Jews that were there in about four or in about 520 BC. So uh, we may not recognize this immediately, but Israel had been back in Jerusalem for about 18 years. They returned uh, under the, the decree of Cyrus in uh, 532 and it is now 520 or uh, yes, 538. And it's now 520. So for about 18 years, they have been in uh, Jerusalem. So it's not like that Haggai is speaking to a people that has just arrived. They have just suffered that uh, political turmoil. And uh, the nations around them had jockeyed for the funding to be cut off. It's not like that had just happened. But there is there's a, a decent amount of time, 18 years, since they've returned. And they had faced some difficult challenges in rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the city. And the Jews had lost sight of the most important thing. And, and notice Haggai is very specific in when this prophecy comes. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month. In fact, we're going to encounter several of these occurrences where he gives us the exact month. The exact day that he gives the prophecy. This is going to allow us to see how quickly the hearts of the nation of Israel either disobey or obey the word of the Lord. So this first prophetic utterance comes to Haggai on, uh, it, during the second year of Darius, the king of Persia, in the sixth month on the first day of the month. And the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet, Zerubbabel and the son of Shittil, the governor of Judah, and Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And this is important. We recognize that, that Haggai was given a prophetic message, and that prophetic message would, had two audiences. First, it had uh, the leaders and the rulers. Uh, that was split between Zerubbabel and Joshua. And, and Haggai had a specific message for the leaders of uh, Israel. He had a specific message to Zerubbabel and to Joshua, but also to the people of Israel. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. 
And, and this here is where Haggai, where the rubber meets the road. Uh, he's been given this prophetic utterance and he comes to the leaders and he comes to the people and he tells them, he tells the leaders, the people say, it's not yet come time, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. It's kind of like that instruction that you received that you really didn't want to do. It was easier to put it off than to tackle the task. What the people of God had realized is, is that this is, this is going to be a struggle. This is going to be a problem. This is going to be hard work. It'll be easier if I just hang out on the couch. If I just hang out at home. If I don't tackle the instruction. Because this is going to be a hard thing. They were going to have to overcome political obstacles. They were going to have to overcome, uh, in fact, probably some bows and arrow shots coming in from the outside. There were, there were people that were, that were dead set on not letting the walls of the temple be rebuilt from outside of Jerusalem. And Haggai tells the leaders, the people say, it's not time to rebuild yet. So this leads me to borrow a phrase from Zechariah. What is all of this about? What is Haggai pushing us to uh, think about? And I think it can be summed up in this. Return to me and I will return to you. You see, God had given the nation of Israel instructions. He had given them something to do, and, and they were being negligent in their obedience. They had started the process. They had started on good footing. But because of opposition, they had gotten bogged down, and they had fallen asleep. They had become complacent. It was easier just to, to go on with the daily routine without having to stretch and try to accomplish what God had given them. God's instruction, God's, uh, God's commands had, had gone uh, and fallen a little bit by the wayside. They had become complacent. And in very many ways, it started to procrastinate uh, in accomplishing God's uh, purposes. Look at verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? It's interesting. Our, my modern uh, age group looks at older uh, construction and probably doesn't look favorably at wood paneling and paneled houses. It's kind of fallen a little bit out of vogue. Now, if you have paneling in your houses and you're happy with paneling in your houses, that is perfectly fine. But I just want to make the point that when Haggai mentions that they have paneling in their houses, it's not, we are not to take it the same way that uh, a 30 year old or a 40 year old may take it in our day. Uh, that paneling was a treasure in the time of Haggai. In fact, Normally, they would build houses out of stone, so it took an extra uh, amount of uh, income and took an extra amount of money to actually attach wood paneling to that stone. Now, they would have had milled that themselves and attached that. And so what Haggai is saying is that, that you have had enough time, you've had enough uh, time to, to uh, build up enough wealth to... Uh, to panel your own houses. Haggai is, is pointing to the fact that now, while the temple was laying in ruins and they were commanded to come back and, and rebuild the temple, that was, um, that was Ezra's vision, that was Nehemiah's vision. They were to, to reconstitute the worship in the temple. And yet they had become consumed by what was in their own houses, what was in their daily lives. You see, God's not telling them that it's wrong that they have paneling on their walls and their houses. 
What was wrong is they had forgotten the instruction that God had given them. Uh, it, it would have been better if they could have done both. It would have been better if they could have paneled their own houses and also worked on the walls and on the structure of the temple. We're going to see that, that God is not uh, pursuing the building of the temple just because he needs an edifice, just because he needs a house, just because he needs uh, this place. But he's pursuing the, the Israelites and, and the, the Jews uh, obeying him and building the temple because it meets a spiritual need in their lives. It meets something that they need more than maybe the paneling on their houses that has taken precedent for them. You see, they had, they had substituted something that was good, and they had, they had settled for that when God had something better in store for them. Now look at verse 5. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. So Haggai had just read raise the question in their minds okay i've devoted a lot of time to my house and zero time to the temple there's an out of balance here god has called us to do something and we need to be obedient and now god calls their attention think about this consider your ways this is a big bright neon flashing light think about this look at this Consider what is happening. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. God, through the prophet of Haggai, speaks to his people and says, think about this. You have sown a lot of seed. But when you go to reap it, your harvest is small. He says, you go to the table and you eat much, but you're never filled. You, you pour a big old glass of whatever you're drinking, and you drink it, but you never feel. And God says, why haven't you thought about that? Why haven't you thought about why this is happening? You've had 18 years. You, you've scrounged and you've worked hard and you've, you've been resourceful and, and you've You've crunched your pennies and, and you're able to purchase the wood and put it on the sides of your house. You've done all that, but it could have been easier. Why? Because God is trying to show them huh, the very fact that he has not blessed the sowing of their seed, the, the eating of their food, the drinking of their drink, the way he, he has given them those things, but he hasn't blessed them to their full. They're missing something. God is calling their minds to the fact that, that they have settled for just the good when God has something better, better for them. You see, God was trying to tell them when they sowed their seed and, and their harvest wasn't what they expected, who is the God of the harvest? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When they eat and they aren't full, who's the God that provided the bread in the, in the wilderness? Uh, when, they, when they drink and they aren't full, who is the God who, who sprung forth out of uh, water out of a rock in the desert? See, God is trying to prod their minds into thinking about. Have we settled for just something good when God has something better for us? And then he starts in again. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. God again says with a bright neon sign, think about this, guys. Ponder this. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. 
God tells them, consider this, think about this. You're not going to think twice about going up to Lebanon and getting some wood to put on the panels of your house. But God says, go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house. What house is he talking about? He's talking about the temple of God. That I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. And at this point, we may wonder, is this just a self-fulfilling instruction? We may wonder if the God that Haggai, or the message that Haggai is presenting, comes from a God that's egotistical and selfish. But that's not the case. Yes, God wants them to go up and get wood and build his house, but there is a reason why God wants them to do that. You see, God wants to bless the nation of Israel. And God wants the, the, them to fulfill the, the very reason that God had, had given them. All the way back in Abraham with the promise that was given to Abraham. God had promised them that they would be a light to the world. God wanted the world to look at Israel and see a people that worship their God and their God bless them. In fact, there is no other God like the God of Israel. God, God's intent was for every other nation to look at Israel and say, my God doesn't treat me like that. There's something about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You see, God recognized that the temple was an, an important and a vital part of the daily life of the Israelites. And it represented that their God dwelt in their midst. And, and God didn't want Israel just to settle with the good. They, they had become complacent. They had been used to worshiping without a temple. They had been in Babylon. They'd been in Assyria. They'd been spread all over that part of the earth. And now they have come back to Jerusalem. And, and all of a sudden, temple worship and worshiping in the presence of their God isn't as important because they've never known it. Look at verse 9. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have wielded the dew, and the earth has with, or withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the old, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. God told them, He says, Look at this. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. God said, I've been trying to get your attention. I've been trying to get you to look. Why is the most important question here, declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. And here, God is not worried. God, God is not consumed by the, by the uh, requirement of having a temple, a place for his dwelling. What he wants to do is to bless his people. He recognizes that his people have lived, every one of them have lived their lives either in captivity or in Jerusalem with a partially built temple. Nobody has experienced the blessing of, of God's presence with his people like before the exile. And God is pointing his people. You're settling for something good when I have something better in store for you. God wants them to take him at his word. They don't know what it's like. They don't know what it's like to have a temple and to worship with God in their presence. They don't know what it's like 
And they haven't grown up that way, but God wants them to take him at his word. He wants them to obey so that he can shower blessings upon them. God says, I've withheld the dew, I've withheld the produce, I've called for drought, and it's going to affect your lives. So the first part of this calls us to return to God, and then God will return to us. God wants us to see him and to pursue him in obedience. He doesn't want us just to settle for something good. It was perfectly all right for the Israelites to line their house with paneling. But by focusing on the paneling and not on the presence of God in their midst, then they had missed, they had exchanged something good for the best that God had for them. And now secondly, we need to obey and God will bless us. We need to obey and God will bless us. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. So God had just presented this prophetic utterance through Haggai to the leaders and to the people. And there is a response. All of a sudden, that neon light, hey, consider this. It had brought dividends. It had brought uh, an open eyes and an open heart. And the high priest and the political leader and the remnant of the people, they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God in the words of Haggai the prophet. As the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. They had a heart change. They recognized that they had been settling for something good when God had something better in store for them. And then in verse 13, Then Haggai the messenger of the Lord spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the people had a change of heart. And now Haggai gives a different message. He tells the people that God is with you. And this is at the heart of the instruction of God. God didn't require a house for him to dwell in just because he needed a house. No, God wanted to bless his people with his presence. God wanted his people to understand uh, what it was like to dwell in the presence of the Lord, for God's presence, for his glory to descend amongst them. They had not experienced that. And now uh, Haggai is saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. God's presence is going to be with them in a way they had not experienced. If they would uh, forsake the goodness and embrace the best, then they will have God's presence with them. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shittil, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Notice whose hearts God worked in first. It's the leadership. God, uh, Haggai had, had given this message both to the leadership and to the people. And the leadership had bought in. They had realized that they had settled for something that was good, but it wasn't the best, and they wanted better for their people and for themselves. The, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. When did they do this? On the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. In 24 days, God had turned the hearts of the nation of Israel. In 24 days, God had done a supernatural work. Think about that. 24 days. Jim, is it easy to get anything political done in 24 days? <laughs> Not so easy, is it? <laughs> God had done something miraculous. He changed the heart of the leaders. He changed the heart of the people. And they are now not just 
just embracing the goodness, yes, they're probably going to have some, some wood on the side, on the, the walls of their house. But they are also going to experience the best of God dwelling with them. And they now have turned their hearts in obedience. They now have started working on the temple. God wants to dwell with his people. He doesn't want them to settle just for the good, but he wants to give them the best. Sometimes we get sidetracked, don't we? Sometimes we just get complacent in life. And sometimes we settle for good enough. And sometimes God has to send somebody like Haggai. Has to send somebody or some circumstance like the fact that we sow seeds and we expect a great harvest and that harvest doesn't come. Sometimes God has to get our intention to reveal to us that he has something better than just good. God has the best. And at that point, we have to just respond in obedience. This is a good news story because this time Israel didn't set their face against God. They didn't stiffen their neck as the Old Testament prophets are, are uh, apt to describe the people of God. They, they relented. They recognized that God had something better for them and they wanted to pursue that. Haggai chapter 1 shows us why we need to not miss it. If God has something good for us, we don't need to settle for good enough. We need to shoot for his best. How do we do that? Well, we take him at his word and we obey him. When he speaks, we listen. And when he leads, we follow in obedience. That's what the nation of God did. And yes, they're probably going to have the wood panels on the wall, but they are going to have the presence of God in their midst. Have you settled just for good enough? Does God have something better for you? Has, has God been trying to get your attention? If so, we need to listen up. We need to look to Him. We need to listen. And follow his leading. He promises us from the words of, of Zachari Zachariah, the very next book, I believe it's uh, verse 5, where he says, Return to me and I will return to you. No, it's verse 3. He literally says that to uh, the people of Israel. At the same time that Haggai is prophesying, Zechariah is saying the same thing Return to me and I will return to you. If we do that, we need to obey, and then God will bless. If the Lord is speaking to you, I encourage you uh, to follow him. Just as if the Lord is speaking to me, I need to follow him too. If, you don't, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's where this begins. <laughs> you have settled for not so good when God has the best store for you. Uh, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you have missed the blessings that he wants to bestow on your life. If you don't know him as Lord and Savior, then I encourage you uh, to follow him today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we thank you for this message from Haggai. Lord, this reminder. Lord, uh, sometimes we receive instruction that confounds us. But Lord, we just need to be obedient and listen. Lord, we need to recognize that you have blessings for us and that if we will obey, obediently follow you, then we will receive the blessings that you have intended for us. Lord, if we settle for just good enough, we're going to miss the blessings that you have intended for us. Lord, I pray that each one of us would follow you uh, with our whole hearts. And Lord, that we would seek not to miss those blessings. Lord, I pray that you would uh, be with us. 
Uh, Lord, that you would uh, help us to take one step in obedience and then another and to step by step follow you in obedience. Lord, as you have called us and as you lead and direct our hearts. Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, if anyone's here that doesn't know you, I pray, Lord, that they would uh, respond uh, to the message of the gospel this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, uh, there is good news. In fact, there is the best news. Uh, but to get to the best news, we have to recognize the bad news. The bad news is that uh, we are sinners. Uh, we follow in the same uh, pattern as Adam and Eve. Uh, Adam and Eve uh, dis turned their backs and disobeyed the Lord, and that relationship between God and them was broken. They couldn't walk with God in the garden any longer. The bad news is, is that we are in the same place as Adam and Eve. Uh, our sins have separated us from God. Uh, there is no way for that relationship to be healed. The worst news is, is that we can't do anything to fix that. Uh, the, the bad news is that we are in a bad spot. The worst news is that there's no way that we can fix the problem. Uh, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. What we've earned by our sins is God's judgment and death, and we can't uh, fix that. Uh, dead corpses don't rise by themselves, do they? It just doesn't happen. We can't do that. But thanks be to God, he didn't leave us to wallow in the, the bad news and the worst news. But he gave us the good news. The good news is that God made a way he, through the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus died on that old rugged cross in our place. He bore our sins and uh, he offers us the free gift of eternal life. The good news is that Jesus makes a way of restored relationship with the Father. And the best news is that Jesus' death on, on uh, the cross can be applied to our account. How does that happen? It happens through faith. We have to take Jesus at his word. It's kind of hard to reconcile how someone can die for someone else and, and their goodness can be applied uh, to the account of those who, who don't have any goodness. But that's what Jesus did. We have to believe that, that Jesus did exactly what he said he did, uh, that he died in our place, and we have to trust him. We have to, to uh, live with him as the king of our lives. Each one of us uh, was born with a king on the throne. And, and the very beginning of our lives, and until that point where we have bowed our knee to King Jesus, that person was us. We are our own king. We go our own way. But that's not how God designed us. God designed us for his son to be king of our lives. And we need to follow him. So if we believe that Jesus did what he says he did, and we follow Jesus as our king, uh, we obediently and uh and trustworthily follow him, then we too can have uh, the promise of eternal life. That's the way to uh, salvation. That is the best news. So if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning, that is the way to redemption, just to believe and to follow him. Uh, 